guest on today's show is Ryan Nakata. In his work, Ryan applies mediation and conflict resolution skills as he works on themes of political depolarization and countering violent extremism. He teaches diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings using a complexity theory perspective, and he helps facilitate the creation of conflict-resilient cultures. Ryan is the co-founder of Meta Ideological Politics, where he seeks to reframe ideology as an analytical tool instead of a fundamentalist dogma. Ryan is also a great writer, and he has written some of my favorite articles on Medium, and I'll make sure to include some of those in the show notes. I met Ryan last year as I was developing the OmniWin project, and I've come to think of him a bit as a philosophical doppelganger of mine. He's here because I want to share with you his insights and wisdom around the ideas of ideology and how do we overcome polarization. And I also want you to hear some of the lessons that he's come to as he's had direct experience communicating across extreme differences. I broke this conversation with Ryan into two parts. So this is part one. In this part of the conversation, Ryan and I talk about the meaning of ideology and how ideology impacts both our society and ourselves. We talk about the importance of approaching others with dignity and respect, and we hear about Ryan's approach to talking with people who have extremist beliefs. In part two, we talk about how we might actually make changes in our system and culture. And we talk about how we deal with our pessimism, but the possibility that real change might not actually happen. And if you want to hear episode two, you don't have to wait any longer. It's already available for you. But for now, let's get on with part one of my conversation with Ryan Nakata. This was recorded in March of the year 2022. So thank you for being here, Ryan. Um, we met last year, and I've just been so excited to talk to you. So thanks for being here right now. Yeah, thank you, Duncan. Thanks for uh, inviting me, and I'm really excited about this conversation. So yeah, it's been a pleasure to get to know you, and we have so many common interests. I think I joked to you, like, I think we're the same person. <laughs> uh, so let, I'm really looking forward to digging into that. Yeah, I sometimes will shorthand when talking about you to my partner. will say, like, you know, my my intellectual doppelganger, that Ryan, like that's you. Totally, so, uh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> the mediation um, thing and yeah, totally. And that's the fun thing is I'm actually really looking forward to introducing you to other doppelgangers of mine and so forth. And but for now, we're gonna unpack some of the wisdom in your head today. And so thank you for sharing your framework and with me. But let's go ahead and start right at the top. How would you describe some of the problems we're facing right now in our political culture and or democratic system or both? Yeah. Well, obviously, there's a million problems that all feed into each other in different ways that no one can fully understand. And the amount of uh, variables and uh, you know causal pathways that create things like polarization or societal breakdown are uh, too much to catalog here, right? I mean, we have everything from social media and algorithms and filter bubbles and feedback loops and disinformation. We have democratic dysfunction. We have poor political leadership. We have culture war fragmentation and so forth. So I could go on and on and on about all of the, the problems and, and how they all contribute to this, what's called like a wicked problem, right, of polarization and, and democratic breakdown. But my angle that I like to think about, and, and this is part of my work in meta-ideological politics, right, is looking at the role of political ideology and how that creates a lot of problems, but also the fight or the culture war debate around ideology or that involve ideological clashes could be the potential leverage point towards working towards a solution and also kind of mediating these conflicts writ large in society. So I'm trying to take all of the bad stuff and leverage that or channel that into something beneficial for everyone. So while it's it's very disheartening and sad to see all of the polarization, fragmentation, I also feel hopeful, you know, kind of like the old phrase, where there's like a conflict, there's opportunity. Well, I appreciate that. So when you're at, it sounds like as you're leaning into this idea of, of ideology, obviously the ideological differences and the way that people are seeing them as a clash and irreconcilable and teaming up into their ideological teams that's 
a problem in a certain way. But I also hear you saying that by understanding ideology and how it's working and actually getting to understand what the different ideologies are, that potentially we can capture that there's a real opportunity there. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I want to, maybe we can just like jump right into some of the principles that you were kind of holding with your meta ideological uh, politics, you know, framework. I know you're thinking about like personal ideological awareness, like how, what, just becoming aware of what my own ideologies are and, and then recognizing that everything's really much more complex and that nothing's really going to get solved by one thing. So that kind of sense of complexity and then the fact that we're all changing all the time. And so having the virtue of sort of talking to these different ideologies or holding space for them, but they're your principles. Why don't you tell us about the kind of three principles of this approach? Sure. I'm thinking maybe we should start one step back and describe yeah. what is ideology and what is meta ideology. Go for it. Sure. So Ideology to me is a really interesting word because the dictionary definition of ideology and the historical definition of ideology, uh, which was created by a French Enlightenment thinker named Antoine de Tracy in 1796, just means the science of ideas. So it's a very neutral term, right? It means that we have some kind of framework with which we use to see and make sense of political and social realities that also inform the pres our prescriptive measures, right? Policy solutions, et cetera to make society better and to move towards our ideal picture of what society should be like. So that, so, so to me, ideology has a more neutral definition, right? It's just a system of ideas and ideals that inform what we think we should do about society, you know, po political systems and so forth. Uh, it's now been weaponized in a kind of a pejorative fashion to mean someone who's basically a dogmatic fundamentalist who has an unwavering allegiance to a single perspective and will not update their uh, perspective when they receive new evidence, right? So it's almost like a fundamentalist religion. That's the new way that people think about ideology when they, you know, it's like, oh, you're being too ideological, right? Like you're being too rigid and you're not seeing reality clearly. If only you would drop your ideology, then you would just see the truth like I do, right? So my, I'm not going to debate people if they want to use a, de a negative definition, because I just say, if you, whatever definition you use, if you think ideology is a neutral thing, or you think ideology is a bad thing, Meta, -ideo meta ideology could potentially be the answer, right? So meta, meta just means beyond. It's a Greek word means beyond. So, so technically meta ideology just means beyond ideology, but also noting that in my opinion, you can never fully escape ideology, right? Any position you have on any issue is partly informed by ideology. So it's like, what is your position on gay marriage? What is your position on guns, right? What is your position on law enforcement? Whatever answer someone gives will be ideologically laden or influenced to some degree. So that's a kind of epistemic humility, right? Knowing that we can never fully escape ideology. We're always going to use frameworks and kind of systems of thought to try to make sense of political and social economic realities. And we can't fully get away from that. So let's try to be aware of it, right? And this kind of bleeds into the first principle what I've been calling ideological awareness. And that's simply, you are coming from a particular frame of reference, right? But from a particular set of ideas and ideals and values and systems perceptions. And you're probably seeing things that are important to notice and you're probably missing something, right? And it's kind of like the old phrase, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And where meta ideology comes in is the second part of that phrase is, but if you don't have the hammer, you might miss the nail. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so ideology can blind us, but it can also enable sight. And the key to doing that is to one, be aware that you're coming from a particular frame of reference and two, try to non-exclusively utilize more than one framework. Right. So can you rotate through multiple ideologies to see the world in different ways and to make sure that you don't miss something. And nowadays part of the culture where is people are getting very upset that you can't see what I can see. Like, how could you not see uh, systemic racism and the, and the ways in which minority groups or marginalized groups are systematically oppressed in society, right? Like, how could you not see that? We need to become woke to those dynamics, right? Or if you talk to someone of a more conspiratorial bent, it's like, how could you not see all of the deep state corruption and all of the bad things that are happening behind the scenes and the ways that the elites, you know, manipulate systems for their own benefit while screwing over the people. How could you not see that, right? How could you not see the truth about vaccines? So it's, it's like everyone's complaining that 
I can see something that you can't see. And I can only see that through the lens that I'm using. So my answer is let's just go meta. And instead of just locking into one lens, let's utilize multiple lenses so we don't get overly attached to one while always being aware that we can never truly get over seeing the world through a lens. Does that make sense? Yeah, it absolutely makes sense. And I, there's a couple of layers here that I find interesting. Well, one, I, there's something about just like having neutral approach and that people see, can see this as positive or see it as negative, but really it's just a concept. And I, I think about that sometimes with conflict transformation, that there's a there's a sort of a moral aspect to it that like once you understand how conflict works or once you understand how ideology works you can turn that into something positive or you can turn that into something pretty negative too i mean if i know how to stop conflict i know how to create conflict right just as easily and and then what's more is that but I, I, what I'm appreciating right here is that like also that sense of like guiding values, like that, that this is all of us have a certain set of things that we believe are, are the ways to do things or not the way to do things. And those can be idiosyncratic to us as individuals. Each of us have our own sort of certain set of guiding values that are sort of moving us through the world. And there's a way that we can sort of each of us in our own head get to have a sense of like, this is what's okay, and this is what's not okay. That's a natural thing for each of us to have in our own selves. But those become our own standards of integrity, but not necessarily ones that we can say that everyone else needs to follow. Because if we pay any attention, we recognize there's a lot of diversity of different perspectives and approaches and values and so forth. And so, and one of the things that I'm also hearing though, this thing is the most interesting is that whatever our ideology is, whatever our framework or paradigm for seeing the world is, we can only understand it, like that's gonna create us to see certain things and not see other things. And, and oftentimes what we'll see is what's great about our idea and what's not, what's the problem about the other idea. And there's, it's like such a classic thing in conflict that people are just like talking over each other, being like, I want you to hear what's important about me, but not really willing to listen to that other side. So I think, what is kind of the, what do you see as some of the, the, the steps that someone might go through to recognize their own ideology, to open up to another person's ideology, to even learn to really grok it or value it, even if they don't agree with it. I don't know if this is where some like straw man, steel man comes in or, or how, you know, what is the process for an individual to sort of grow through those phases? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I was just looking um, at an article from the field of, of violence de-radicalization, and they were talking about what are the actual building blocks of your ideology, right? Like, and how can we kind of become aware of what those building blocks are and and then think about and then from that kind of introspective process gain awareness or gain meta awareness of the predominant frame of reference that we're using and that we're coming from i think there's a lot of different ways you can categorize it right like there are questions about what are your assumptions about human nature right or about human agency or about free will right what are, what are your assumptions about society in general in terms of should we is society right now fine as it is uh does it need some minor tweaks do we need massive transformations and reforms do we need to go back to a better time right so you can kind of start to see ideology will start to seep in and you can kind of you can kind of lay out all the building blocks explicitly right you can talk about like you know like what party you're affiliated with you can talk about what policies you support another one my favorite question is like what do you think is the biggest threat to america or to society or to the world Another one would be like, let me think, would be uh, like, how do you want other people to see your ideology or your side, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, another question I really like, who do you think has all the power? Who do you, which side or which ideological camp or which political party has the power? And how do you determine power, right? Like, how do you determine what are the variables that constitute uh, someone having more power or that 
or how do you notice if there's a power imbalance, right? So the, all of these things can kind of reveal bits and pieces of people's ideology coming out. I think there's a, a British systems theorist named Gerald Nigley, who I really like, and I've learned a lot from him. He has a process called exploring boundary judgments. So for him, our perception of the system consists really of two parts. There's our core values, and then there's what he calls boundary judgments, right? So core values are core values, right? There's what you value, what you deem to be most important. And boundary judgments are what you're able, what you, in your perception, what are you drawing boundaries around? And that becomes a way of looking at what you're able to see and what becomes salient to you, right? So for example, if you're a nationalist, or let's say more of like a conservative, maybe like a Trump supporter, the boundaries are drawn around America against the globe, right? So it's kind of like the nationalists are against the globalists. And so that's how they're drawing boundaries, right? If you're coming from more of a DEI, racial justice, anti-racism framework, the boundary judgments are around identity, right? Like what's becoming salient is I'm drawing boundaries around differences in let's say race, sex, gender, uh, and so forth, and making those differences salient to me, right? If I'm a libertarian, I might draw boundaries around the state and the market and look at the harmful impacts of government intervention and in screwing up market dynamics or infringing on people's civil liberties, right? If I'm a progressive, I might be drawing boundary judgments around the public sphere, right? Around the environment, around the commons, and the ways that corporations might damage these public... So all of these are different boundary judgments, right? You can think about it in time, like in terms of time, like maybe if you're a conservative, the boundary judgment is around America in the 50s or 40s or, you know, thinking about how good things used to be and that we need to go back or get something good from the past and bring it into the present. Or maybe you're drawing boundary judgments around the present and the future and you, we need progressive radical style transformation to fundamentally transform the system to make everyone's lives better. So Gerald Nigley's idea is that these boundary judgments have a recursive loop and relationship with your core values, right? So only focusing on core values is not enough because it ignores this aspect of seeing. But people, what people see tends to also feed it back into what their core values are. So if I were to break it down, I would, I like his kind of simple binary of core values and boundary judgments. And then through reflecting on those, we can start to be, gain more meta-awareness of the ideological frameworks we're coming from and therefore become aware, aware of our biases and blind spots. I, thank you. This is really cool. So it's not just by understanding other people's ideologies or our own ideology. We're not just getting aware of what are our value judgments, but we're also being aware of what we're aware of. Um, yes. And that's really helpful. I, I in, in conflict resolution, I'll often think about like what we're doing is we're going from two people facing each other as the problem to becoming two people standing by side and looking at the problem. But they're really usually not standing by side. They're kind of stepping back. And if you can they're all looking at the problem from a different perspective and they have information that the other one doesn't have about whatever the issue is. And in our democratic process, if it was working well, we could theoretically have multiple, multiple perspectives looking at a certain issue and be able to like, this is not part of the thing we have to do is get out of like gun issues and be like this or that, you know, just this black or white question that really there's 350 million different perspectives on this question. And we're going to get a more precise understanding of it by what are we paying attention to? And it's helpful with the different ideologies because someone's like, I'm looking at this from a racial lens. I'm looking at this from a individual versus the state lens. I'm looking at this from a public safety lens. And those are totally different things. You're going to be seeing different information, different data, and that's to be understood that our ideology is going to be making different things salient and other things not. So it's a wonderful addition to this way of thinking about this. So I, I know there's a lot more to your framework and your kind of approach here. I'm curious about what you're working on like, what are you doing with this? Tell us a little bit about like how you're hoping to take this media ideological, um, political framework and apply it. You know, what's, where are you leaning in the system? What, how, what are you, how are you trying to use this to help us with our issues? 
Yeah, totally. Uh, just to just to share something, Duncan. I what's kind of on my mind right now is we started getting into the uh, the three principles, and we only did one. <laughs> But I can connect the two to what I'm doing now, kind of bring it together. Thanks. I appreciate that. I was tracking that myself. And so thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank, oh, if yeah. that's okay to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So um, part of, so the second, so the first principle of MIP is ideological awareness, right? The second one is complexity. And my kind of ontological starting point or starting point of, in terms of what I believe the nature or structure of reality is is that reality, especially our social systems and human civilization is so complex, it's irreducibly complex, so that no one framework or ide ideological, uh, ideological camp or school of thought can capture all of the complexity, right? So it's, I'm a Marxist, anarchist, libertarian, traditional conservative, Christian Democrat, neoconservative, paleo-libertarian, whatever it is, not, not, that one framework just simply cannot capture the system in its totality. So instead of abandoning ideology or abandoning the framework, let's just use more frameworks, right? Let's become literate and competent in more frameworks so that we can see this, we can try to see the system in its wholeness and not miss things or not be blind to certain things. And, and in doing that, yeah, just embracing ideologies non-exclusively and kind of tuning your sense of salience, right? So, so I think the danger of being locked into one ideology is that you're only going to see uh, some things and then those things become hyper salient to you and then that just crowds out everything else and then your sense of what's important to focus on becomes skewed and then everyone will attack you who doesn't agree with you that you're not focusing on the real important things right so meta ideal this, this principle of complexity is saying hey let's embrace all of the key insights from as many ideologies as we can uh, so that we don't become blind and we can try to see the system in its wholeness and then the third one is is like this notion of like intellectual humility and personal growth. And I like to build on the concept of cultural humility and cultural competency, right? So cultural humility is like, it's gained a lot of popularity in like social justice circles um, where it's like, we want to reflect on our own culture and our own beliefs and also be open to learning about other people's cultures, right? And then cultural competency is like, let's become competent in understanding other cultures so that we can interact with people on their own terms and have productive discussions with them and appreciate the cultural differences, right? Appreciating cultural diversity. So I like to talk about ideological competency and ideological diverse humility, right? And that's basically saying, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna continually as a lifelong process, investigate my own frameworks, my own perspectives, my own biases and leanings, and be able to communicate with people on their own terms, right? Using their own language and talking to their core values and boundary judgments. And that's the ideological competency part, right? Which is basically all about meeting people where they are and not trying to impose your ideology onto them or to persuade them to join your side, but to meet them on their own terms and have a conversation with them on their own terms and build a bridge that way. So I'm starting with you and your perspective, and then we'll build a relationship together. And so the work, the, how I apply this, so I, I kind of am in two fields. So one is mediation, dialogue, and depolarization where I actually teach dialogue workshops where people explore all of these things. I lead depolarization workshops where people do a lot of introspection and on all the things you just talked about so far. And then they talk to each other about what they discovered about those introspective processes, right? So you generate self-insight and share the insights. The other work that I do, which is far more exciting and dangerous, is I recently got into the field of violent radicalization, like de-radicalizing violent extremists who adhere to ideologies, everything from Proud Boys to like Antifa and the Black Panthers and neo-Nazi groups and so forth. And unfortunately in Portland, we are kind of like the, the world's epicenter of ideological gang warfare. <laughs> it's insane, completely insane beyond anyone's wildest imagination. It's really, really terrible. And so I basically go and study all of these ideologies that are labeled extreme and crazy and dangerous. And then I try to go and talk to people on their own terms. And there's something it, you gain People respect you when it, you signal that you've put in the effort to learn about their school of thought, and they respect that you might even know more than they do about their own ideology, right? And in this age where ideology is so merged with your personal identity, in order for me to, in order for someone to really feel like they are understood, you kind of need to understand their ideology, 
right? You can't bypass the ideology and just say, tell me about your life and your emotions and your values. You can do that and that's great. And that's definitely part of the process of de-radicalization and community building. But when people are so merged with their ideology, right? When they're so identified and entangled with their ideology, you can only explore their personal identity by exploring their ideology. And how do I do that? Well, I go and read a shit ton about what they believe in and remix it and make it make sense in my own head. And then I go and we have a conversation. So that and so that's kind of my work, right? And then from there, you can look at more uh, kind of subtle, subtle ways of finding where there's windows, where there are openings in their ideology to kind of plant seeds of like de-radicalization or nonviolence, right? And and then working with them on their own terms that align with their own interests at the time, but may accidentally produce positive externalities or benefits for the whole community. So it's like what would that be like? Well, let's say that you're an activist and you want to change everyone's mind to your side. Well, what's the best way to communicate your ideology to other people, right? What kind of communication skills do you need to use? Well, it sounds a hell of a lot like what we're promoting here, right? It's just listening, there's talking to people on their own terms, there's perspective taking, it's translating your thing to their thing. So even if your goal is to persuade someone, in the act of doing so, you can accidentally create positive developments for the community. You can build relationships, right? You can get along with the other side. You can take more perspectives and kind of expand your own lens in the process. So that's what I'm focusing on doing. I'm not trying to change anyone's mind. I'm helping them to achieve their own goals on their own terms that ends up creating a, something of net benefit to the whole. Oh. oh, gosh, there's so much here to work with. I, I'm, first of all, I'm just like so excited that you're doing this work and you recommended I check out the film about Daryl Davis, who was the black musician who started working with talk, befriending people in the Ku Klux Klan and, and, and helping them take their robes off and step out of that work eventually by gaining that respect and friendship. I, so that piece of just like treating people with respect is so fascinating and so is so big. And so there's part of me wants to go down a question of like that personal work of like how to how to feel confident or safe in your own ideology to be able to go and explore someone else's and be ready to do that. The other part that I find to be interesting I want to hear more about is the way that you get to know their ideology almost better than they do and upgrading it by like really pulling out the stuff that you feel like makes a lot of sense and being able to name the parts that, that might not be working. So maybe there's just like, can you give us like a personal example of just like how does it feel to to like open to an ideology and to and try to find a place of respecting it when it's not easy um, or I don't know how is that going for you? <laughs> That's an excellent question. So I have several things to say. So one is so the, my way of doing that, right? It's like oh, there's this awful stuff out there. People, you know, there's this joke about being like a masochist. Like, I'm going to go and read a whole bunch of like neo-Nazi stuff. or I'm going to go and read a bunch of QAnon books. Or, you know, it's just like, oh my God, right? I got to like, why would I subject myself to this nonsense or really harmful, dangerous stuff? My, so I have kind of different techniques I've developed to, to manage my relationship to this process, right? I think the first one is looking for general very general and very abstract principles, values, critiques, or ideas that don't have to be bad, right? That don't have to be negative, that might become negative, but are in reality, I think, a genuinely kind of good point. So I have something to kind of build on. Then what I do is I take those building blocks and then I plug them into another framework that might actually provide more realistic explanatory power for that phenomenon. So let's take QAnon, for example, right? So a big part of QAnon is a critique against the corruption of the deep state. And really, it's a critique of corruption of every sphere of society, cultural, political, and economic, right? In every sphere, the powerful, the elites are running and upholding a very corrupt system that produces lies and disinformation and 
is a form of war against the people in a way to protect and gain things for themselves, right? And, and when you get into the content, it starts to get pretty wacky. And so I don't like to go into the specific content, but I say, hey, what are the systemic mechanisms in which everything they're saying is actually true? So from, a, from let's say, a complexity theory perspective, we can look at you know, what's called like a power law distribution, which is kind of like an economic theory called the Pareto principle or the 80-20 the principle, right? So over time, in any kind of complex system, you're naturally going to get some kind of hierarchy and income inequality and power inequality. And that's kind of a, an almost naturally emergent property of any system. So you can look at that and say, okay, that, what can we do with that, right? Like, so there's definitely a problem with cert, a, a small group of people having way too much power and probably going to do bad things. What are the, so this has come from evolutionary biology, right? What are the selection mechanisms through which people get selected into positions of power and what kind of personality traits are being selected for, right? So 30% of hedge fund CEOs are sociopaths. That's a disproportionately high amount, given that I think 1% of the population as a whole are sociopaths. How many politicians or elite politicians are have sociopathic tendencies, right? What kind, so we have a broken selection ecosystem, right? The processes that people go through in order to get into a position of power, we will select for people who might do bad things because they're, they've manipulated the system enough to be able to even get into that position. So we can look at broken selection mechanisms, right? We can look at game theory. We can look at the toxic competitive dynamics, the rival versus zero sum dynamics in game theory. It's called like the prisoner's dilemma on the race to the bottom, right? So as everyone competes against each other, um, you're going to end up selecting for people who are able to survive that competitive process. And what kind of traits or skills or personality characteristics do they have such that they're able to outcompete everyone else in the race to the bottom? Probably cheating, probably cutting corners, probably not doing the best things, right? This is problem with like climate change, for example, is all the corporations and nation states are trying to cut corners to be most efficient and maximize returns to profit. And therefore we select for corporations and businesses and nation states that are the best at, at cheating and lying and polluting without uh, taking accountability, right? So that's another part of the broken selection me mechanism from a game theoretic perspective. I could go on and on, you know, systems theory, we can talk about feedback loops and stuff. So now I have a kind of a higher lens through which I can relate to the same ideas. And then we have a conversation and I see what they think about it. Okay, let me just try to like restate this because I think there's something quite interesting here. So looking at the um, worldview and finding like what are some of the good points or the things that are kind of solid ground on which you can meet them at. And like, yeah, so for example, QAnon being like, oh yeah, there's a hierarchy and a bunch of people with power that aren't necessarily have our best interests at heart and it's causing challenges. Like, I remember I had a friend of mine once that did something similar to this, working with like white supremacist groups and even he was like, oh, they're afraid that our culture might not keep on having them be people in power and that white people will not continue to be the leaders of everything in the future. And they're worried about that. And it's like, okay, that's a legitimate concern. It's totally going to happen, <laughs> you know, and whatever, you know, and, the, and, but then building from that going from like other different tools or different pieces of knowledge you have other approaches that maybe answer these questions that don't require the like the complex wacky sort of interpretations of it must be a, some satanic cabal or right. yeah or we need to you know start the race war or whatever these other conclusions that people might be coming to and and sort of helping them and sort of seeing, so it sounds like this is what's important to you. And does this answer the question? Or does this help understand it? And like, and like, kind of like offering alter alternatives, paths, and exploring that with them, by making sure that you know what they're at first. Is that kind of where I'm at? Where you at? Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, and yeah. I, I think it, you know, there's a distinction between finding common ground and building higher ground. So this is a way of building higher ground together. If I can't meet, if we don't have any common ground to stand on, I'll try my best to build higher ground with you and see where the conversation can go from there. And that also prevents me from being so allergic. I can't stand a conversation with them or um, read any of the stuff because I'm translating into other frameworks I've, I've studied to kind of gain a higher perspective or a, 
a more nuanced, more complex perspective instead of getting to the wacky details, all of the satanic cabal, right? Totally, yeah. It's like, can this be explained through people just playing the game of capitalism and really being good at it? Yes. So I want to, so one of the you know goals here is to sort of be creating a, a, like a bit of a bridge between like all these other different ways of thinking around things. I know that something that you're really good at is taking all these different kind of complex theories like integral theory or game B and all these different, you know, people that are coming up with different ideas and kind of helping distill it down into something that really makes sense. And one of the things that I've appreciated you talking about is what this idea of straw manning and like steel manning and then like where you've gone with some of that. And I don't know, just love for you just to break down like what are these concepts? Because I think that like the logical fallacy, the straw man fallacy is a very classic that we can see in our politics a lot. So, and yeah, tell what, what is this straw man thing? Why are people the straw man people? What does that mean? Yeah, so this is the part on all the mans. <clears throat> yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So the straw man is unfortunately something we see all the time, especially on Twitter. It's all about being, it's all about distorting and oversimplifying and misrepresenting someone's argument or perspective. So that if I repeat it back to you, my straw man interpretation of what you said, you would say, dude, that's not what I said. And then we're not understanding each other, we're talking over each other, we're fighting, right? So straw man usually involves like oversimplifying people, distorting what they said, and misrepresenting what they said, omitting key details. You're making their argument weaker than how they articulated it. And then you, the idea of the fallacy is you attack that weakened argument that they didn't really make and then pretend to debunk it and then say, see, I got you. And the person said, dude, you completely, you attacked a straw man. You attacked a distorted misrepresentation of what I said, not what I actually said. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think like you know, a, a, a group that I see gets straw manned a lot is the January 6th, you know, insurrection and being like, these people just want to overthrow our democracy and they just want to destroy America. And it's like, hold on. I don't think that that's what they think that they're doing. Exactly. Right? And if that's, if that was true, you know, that's fine. Uh, but there might be more nuance here. So trying to say like, okay, we're not, you know, cause then it, it makes it too easy to attack them and say that they didn't have any reason to be doing whatever they were doing. So I know that the next thing that people talk about is steel manning. So the response to steel manning is to, instead of attacking the, or, or interacting with the weakest side of your argument, that I actually really understand, like what's the strong, what are you trying to say? And then I have a debate with that strong, like with the, with the real thing that you're trying to say, right? And and this is, can be really cool. I've seen this happen in great, um, like debates where they have the guests start with explaining the other person's framework first. Thank you for listening to the Omni Win Project podcast. This episode was with Ryan Nakata, the co-founder of Meta Ideological Politics. If you enjoyed this episode, I encourage you to subscribe to the podcast right now. There is so much more where that came from. And in fact, Part two of this episode is waiting for you in the podcast feed right now. In part two, Ryan talks about how developing an advanced understanding of another person's perspective can get them to respect you a lot more than you might expect. And I talk about the idea of you statements and how I use them to help people articulate their thoughts better when we're in conflict. And Ryan opens up about his pessimism about our political future and the importance of structural reform. I am so grateful to Ryan for being on this podcast and for being a friend and for being a colleague. If you want to hear more about Ryan or the meta ideological politics, I encourage you to check out their YouTube feed and you can find all the links that you need in the show notes. And now, as you go on with the rest of your day or start to listen to part two, I invite you to remember that we are all co-creating our future 
right now. And we all have a role to play in the whole. Thank you for listening to the Omni Win Project podcast. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.